Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, <laughs> everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you all in this webinar series of CAFI, another episode of this, the series that we have been promoting. Today, we are going to be discussing document production in international arbitration with Nathan O'Malley. Uh, this is uh, not only a very important and good topic to be discussed, but also it is our great pleasure to have Nathan O'Malley to uh, uh, be able to discuss it with us today. And uh, of course, Professor O'Malley would need no introduction, but just to make the remarks, he is a professor of law at the U.S. Eagle School of Law, uh, a partner at Music Peeler, a uh, very well experienced practitioner in international arbitration, and author of uh, many, um, many, many writings that have been our reference, especially in this field, and especially his book on rules of evidence in international arbitration that have been an inspiration for all of us. So thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for everyone that are with us today. Uh, we are live streaming in our YouTube channel and I see that we have uh, many colleagues and, and, and friends and students that are with us. Thank you very much. Uh, I would especially like to make the reference and to thank everyone that have been uh, supporting us. Uh, all of our uh, board at CAFI, the Arbitration Chamber of Federa School, our executive committee, and everyone that has been supporting. And our main goal at CAFI, and especially here with the, um, the, 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 the webinar series that we are promoting, is to foster uh, debate and to foster good practices in international arbitration. And uh, I have the impression that uh, document production and evidence production as a whole is one of the core uh, features of, uh, and one of the main things that we have to be concerned once developing good practices in arbitration. So today um, uh, our idea is to discuss the rationale of this document production in international arbitration. And especially considering that arbitration differently from mediation, negotiation, and other types of dispute resolution methods, here we have a final and binding decision and a judicatory process where people are going to be um, attached to follow the final decisions, I guess maybe we have to be very careful about the boundaries, the possibilities. We are dealing with a private system of adjudication and not court. So uh, today we are going to discuss this topic exactly to try to identify all of those possibilities. I would really much like to, to, to welcome also and thank Lucas Gavronki for being with us once again. And well, I'll give you the word to uh, make your remarks and maybe just kick off our discussion here. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. Uh, very good morning, afternoon or evening to you all. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to really thank you, Nathan, for accepting our invitation. It's a great honor to have you. Um, I also would like to thank you, Gabriela, and all uh, the members of the CAF uh, the, uh, board, and the, also the members of its executive group, which uh, alongside with uh, my colleague Andrea Bodanese, uh, Bodanese I coordinate. So uh, thank you so much to, to you all for this opportunity. And last but not least, I would also like to acknowledge Marcio Vasconcelos, my dear friend and one of Nathan's uh, associates back in LA. Uh, he played a key role in articulating this event. So thank you, Marcio, for that. And uh, without further ado, uh, if uh, uh, it's okay for everyone, I would uh, just 
pass the word, uh, pass uh, to you, Nathan, so you can present your uh, initial remarks. Uh, also with uh, a question already, uh, which would be, what is the philosophy of uh, document production, international arbitration, what is behind uh, document production uh, as, a, as a matter? Please. Yeah, no, well, thank you, Lucas, and thank you to Gabrielle as well for the introduction. Um, as, as you mentioned, I am um, based here in Los Angeles, where I am a partner with Music Peeler and also serve on the adjunct uh, faculty for the University of Southern California. So it makes me an adjunct professor there, and 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 I enjoy and I enjoy the opportunity to teach on this topic of international arbitration on a regular basis and. And I enjoy obviously discussions like this because it gives the opportunity to exchange ideas around these topics and um, uh, learn from each other as well as, as share uh, ideas as to how things ought to be developing. And uh, as they are developing, uh, international arbitration is still a very fluid field where things are growing and developing and changing as time goes on. And we'll discuss some of those changes, I think, in today's um, discussion. So uh, very excited to be here and thank you again for, um, for, for uh, inviting me. Uh, regarding the philosophy behind uh, uh, international arbitration and document production specifically uh, in terms of the rules of evidence that govern this, um, we have to kind of cast our minds back a little bit to uh, the earlier days of the development of international arbitration as a practice. And um, we go back to some of the early tribunals that were mixed claims tribunals and various interstate uh, disputes uh, that sort of paved the way for the practice of international arbitration as a way to resolve disputes that crossed essentially cross borders. In those instances, they were disputes uh, involving political affairs and affairs between nations that also led to claims of citizens. And so they, they adopted procedural rules and practices uh, that over time were integrated into the commercial arbitration field in the sense that we borrowed a lot of these uh, ideas. And, and over time, uh, it, the early rules on arbitration really had no uh, provision at all uh, for uh, document production and the exchange of evidence, and especially the idea and the concept that you could compel your, uh, your adversary in the proceeding or the opposing party in the proceeding to turn over documents that were necessarily bad for their case. Uh, the ideas of in an early international arbitration were firmly rooted in the civil law tradition in some, er in some respects. And then certainly it was in this way that um, courts uh, who um, adopted procedures based upon civil law concepts, Napoleonic code, but prior to that, the Roman law legal system, um, I spent many years practicing in one of those jurisdictions. And, and, um, and, and the idea that you could, compel uh, for uh, the other side to turn over a document to you was, was entirely novel uh, to some of those, those systems. And in international arbitration, it, it similarly uh, was the case that, um, that that whole system of document production hadn't really developed in the early stages. So in around 1983, the International Bar Association developed a uh, first set of guidelines for um, for uh, evidence, the taking of evidence, it was recognized that many of the uh, established arbitration rules, which made only really vague references to sort of uh, giving the arbitral tribunal power to uh, compel uh, evidence or to take evidence of one type or another, um, that, that those rules didn't have much uh, to say on, on, on evidence. And um, as, as, as uh, things developed, they, they, they decided, well, we need to come up with a, a sort of a set of rules or principles governing the taking of evidence. Um, and that was first, in 1983, those first guidelines and those, those first rules said nothing about document production, except for the fact that potentially you could compel a party to turn over an original of a document or, or to reveal or to produce a, a, a original of a document that had been referred to in another document, uh, you know, very extraordinarily narrow uh, uh, situation where that could happen. Fast forward to about 1999, um, 
the IBA realized that those original rules hadn't been used very much, didn't really uh, add very much value to what was uh, being currently uh, used and started to revise them to come up with what uh, is essentially the platform of rules that we now are dealing with today. Um, and in that developmental process, they began to uh, realize that the practice of international arbitration had developed over time such that it was recognized that in commercial proceedings uh, or commercial arbitration disputes, um, that there was some scope to allow for parties to be able to request and obtain evidence uh, from the opposing side. And uh, the great fear, of course, and I, and I don't want to take too long on this opening question, but it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a, lengthy, a lengthy question, but answer. But the great fear at that time, uh, especially, and you saw articles and so many things being written that, that uh, this was heralding the Americanization of international arbitration um, was really uh, put out there because the idea that, as it said in the original 1999 or the first 1999 rules of the IBA rules on the taking of evidence, um, it said you could ask for a narrow category of documents. So not only could you ask for a single document, but you could ask for a category of documents. And this, this kind of, you know, for a lot of practitioners very much rooted in the ideas of, of, of civil law procedure, this book sort of blew their mind. They said, you can't, you cannot do this. Uh, this is a problem. But it, the, the truth is the 1999 committee, subcommittee that developed these rules was or, only codifying what was already happening in practice. Uh, arbitrations taking place in Europe and, and so forth, we're already doing these things. And, um, and, and so they basically put in some formal rules and guidelines around a practice that was already developing. And to that extent, uh, it wasn't the Americanization of the process at all. Uh, if, if you've ever had the unfortunate um, circumstance of having to deal with American style discovery, as we call it, a document discovery, you realize, and, 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 and then you've also done arbitration uh, document production, you realize that they're the worlds apart uh, in the sense that they are uh, completely different in their, both their orientation uh, and their focus and, and the intent. And so that's an important thing to remember is that what we've developed, what has developed here over time is a truly international approach to this issue um, with rules that are balanced between both civil and common law concepts uh, on this question. And, and, and at the same time uh, is a process that's intended very much in my view. And I think I, I tend to side with my civil law colleagues more than I do with my own sort of American or common law friends on this issue. But I, I, the rules very much are oriented more towards the filling of gaps in the evidentiary record, which is to say that the parties have prepared their case, they've brought their case, but in the course of their pleading of the case, it's become evident that there is some evidence that bears upon the outcome of this case that needs to be produced. And, and, and that's the in intent of the process is, is to allow a means and a mechanism for that to occur. Um, that's different from the fishing expedition where someone has no understanding of what their case is about and expects the other side to produce all their evidence to, to show them uh, to establish their case. So that's, that's the approach that you find within the IBA rules and, and, and the general approach to document production and international arbitration. And so I would say those are the sort of philosophical underpinnings of how we got to, to where we are today. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I guess it's quite interesting that we can see that this uh, transnational characteristic of arbitration can be one of probably the main features of the, the, the development, but also the challenge, because we do know that the parties, even though uh, the practice might have been developed and the rules might be developed to cope with this different backgrounds and cultures and so on. We still do have parties coming to arbitration and having uh, uh, possibly uh, different backgrounds that, that, that might still pose a challenge. So I have possibly two questions here um, regarding that, uh, especially considering that your practice was, um, uh, and your experience is 
uh, not only regarding the American scenario, but you mentioned that you had a great part of your career also uh, practicing in, in Europe and also having some experience here. So um, my I have one, one question regarding that, which is if you still feel that even with the development of, of the practice and of the rules, uh, those issues related to the background of the parties, especially if they come to, uh, from civil law traditions or common law traditions, if they are still felt, if we do actually have a transnational uh, and a different environment that would overcome totally the, the background of the parties. And, and also, th there is one thing that might be uh, specifically impacting that, and, and we are feeling that, for example, here in Brazil now, maybe uh, a little more than in the past, but uh, also developing, which are uh, concerns related to regulations, especially regarding data protection, and, and, and how to deal and handle that. You see, my point is, I know that, and I'm totally in favor of that idea that arbitration, international arbitration should be seen as this transnational environment that maybe we will overcome the background, the legal rules that would come domestically. Uh, but my question is, can we actually do that? Or should we do that? And do we do that in, in, in the practice of arbitration nowadays, especially considering your experience? Well, I think, I mean, yes. I, I mean, I think that you, you, you definitely, so I'll take your, uh, your question in two parts. First is that I think that, that when you have a proceeding, I mean, there's no doubt about it that when parties um, come to a proceeding, the, 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 the tenor and, and the application of the standards uh, that we're talking about today can be influenced by the background of both the arbitrator, the parties, and their lawyers. There's there's no doubt about that. That 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 does uh, affect. For instance, one of the standards that we talk about is in Rule Three of the IBA Rules, which says that you're supposed to produce a narrow category or out request a narrow category of documents. And so, the question is, is, as we as lawyers, we know that we can take any descriptive term and we can argue over what it actually means. And uh, for 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 uh, um, for an American attorney uh, that comes from a jurisdiction where document production is is traditionally a massive undertaking with expansive and large amounts of documents being requested and taken in, narrow can mean you know this. Whereas the civil law attorneys who may have no experience in this in their domestic uh, context uh, can think that narrow means this. So we can have those debates. Uh, within within um, the, the, the discussion of what the IBA rules require and what the standards are that ought to be applied. So there is some of that for sure. Um, but I'm one of those people and, 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 and unfortunately recently we've seen some pushback on this, I think, but I'm one of those people that does believe in the transnational practice of arbitration. Um, and I believe that it, having spent uh, the first 11 years of my career working in a jurisdiction which I was a civil law jurisdiction and was was not um, based on my uh, ideas. Um, and seeing across Europe, people of all of all backgrounds, uh, Brazilians, uh, Americans, Australians, English, working in Paris and and and, and, and Vienna and different places where um, you had people of all all backgrounds working outside of their natural jurisdiction in this field, I can say that there certainly is an international a transnational approach to this. And the reason why I drafted, even wrote my book, uh, quite frankly, uh, to begin with, uh, the first edition was I got tired of having to continually go back again and again and again, explaining these transnational standards and ultimately, and most of the times prevailing because the arbitrators knew that they were true as well. Uh, and I wanted to, and others who have written, and there's so many things written about international arbitration, we, we, we couldn't feel a uh, a room, we'd, be, we'd need several rooms to fill all the books uh, that are written on the topic. Um, the idea is to try to establish these transnational norms. And so there's limits, I'd say, to what you can say a background of either a party or an arbitrator uh, have in terms of the influence on the proceeding in most circumstances. The parties can always change the proceeding and agree to make it a very local one, in which case I argue that it's really not 
international arbitration anymore. But um, the question always is in our minds, what is international arbitration? And, and it is my, my firmly held belief that international arbitration is defined by the practices and approaches that are transnational. And those, those will vary. Those will have changes in different regions of the world to some extent or another. But what we look to establish, hopefully, is a bandwidth uh, in which those variations still exist uh, and, and are recognizable, such that parties can have, in principle, a procedure that they recognize in, uh, uh, in, in South America as much as they can in Asia. And, uh, and, 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 and with, of course, uh, what we could say, maybe flavors of the region uh, being added to what is taking place, but nevertheless, something that is recognizable and was taking place. So uh, I think the IBA rules uh, establish those, those, that bandwidth. I think that the practices associated with them establish that bandwidth, but I think uh, we have to acknowledge that there is regional flavors to this, uh, backgrounds that can play a role, but at the same time, we do try to see that there is a, a transnational approach to these things in international arbitration. Thank you. Um, ah, first, I forgot to, to uh, tell our audience that uh, they could make questions in the chat box uh, in YouTube. So we'll try to address them as many as you can in the final part of this event. Okay. Uh, moving on, uh, Nathan, since you've referred these variations in the governing rules of document production, uh, not just regarding uh, the regional flavors, as you put it, but we now have uh, a movement which would uh, which is trying to present an alternative in regard to the IB rules, uh, the break rules. Is there really need? Uh, is there a need for a second set of rules? It's my opinion that there's not. Um, it's my opinion that they're there that they are a um, uh, an unnecessary uh, uh, addition. Um, here, I guess I have three objections generally to the IBA rules, and just briefly, they are or sorry, the Prague rules, not the IBA rules, but the Prague rules. The first is is that anything that you want to do under the Prague rules, uh, you can do under the IBA rules. Um, the IBA rules don't require you to have document production. They don't require the arbitrators to give a certain degree of document requests, approve, approve a certain degree of document requests. They don't require uh, the parties to wait till a certain point in the arbitration to do document production. You can do it earlier if you want, if that's what the, the tribunal wants to do. Um, there's an enormous amount of flexibility within the IB rules and it's a wrong idea to think that they compel a certain type of outcome. They don't. They're used there to guide a proceeding that the parties and the arbitrators uh, to one extent or another feel is necessary. So that's the first point. You don't need a second set of rules. The IBA rules are flexible enough that you can use them. And frankly, the, most of the time, the way the IBA rules are used is as guidelines, non-binding guidelines. The arbitrators refer to them and they say, this is a standard that we're going to apply, and uh, but we're not going to you know, necessarily follow every provision of, of the IBA rules. So that's the first thing. So there's no need for it uh, to my mind. Uh, the, second, uh, the second point I would say about it is, I've, is more of a functionality. I've, I've gone through the prog rules and I've looked at them quite um, closely. And their whole purpose is as their title, their formal title suggests is to promote efficiency uh, in international arbitration. And that means uh, they wanna adopt some things that they think that are, um, are uh, going to help the process out and going to make it a little bit more efficient. But if you look at some of the approaches to it within the prog rules, they are um, advertised as being a very empowering of the arbitrator. Uh, the arbitrator is empowered as an example in rule 5.2, I think it is, to determine uh, who's going to be heard as a witness. It doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, what the parties have produced, um, uh, to who what witness statements have been submitted, whether they have been or not. We're going to determine who the witnesses are, uh, and who's going to be heard at the. Uh, in other words, who's going to be heard at the hearing. 
Uh, well, obviously, if you want to cross-examine a witness, you'll be upset if the arbitrators decide we're going to accept the witness's witness statement and not allow him to be cross-examined at, uh, at, the, at, the, at the hearing. So that's uh, something that you're going to be upset by. Uh, but they say that that's going to create efficiency. But then three rules later, I think it is, or four rules later, I think it's around 5.7 or so, um, they say, but if a party wants to cross-examine a witness, the arbitral tribunal should allow them to. So uh, what that tells me is that some of the things that they've tried to do to, to try to uh, compel the efficiency, they, the rules themselves sort of recognize could violate due process. <laughs> Uh, and so, uh, it, to, so in the end, the, 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 the effect is, is not what is advertised, which is that we're supposed to have this efficient proceeding. Um, uh, another thing is they asked, you know, one of the things that the prog rule suggests is that at the first organizational hearing, the parties just kind of deal with document requests. That's a strange one if you want to produce uh, efficiency, because one of the reasons we organize our the document production in the way we do, which is generally after the, the, the case has been made in chief and the defense in chief has been made through a statement of defense, a statement of claim with all the evidence that we intend to rely on, um, is it allows the arbitrators to see what the case is and then determine what is material and relevant uh, because they've seen the case. If you, if you ask at the very first organizational hearing, I want documents, how is an arbitrator supposed to appropriately judge what is truly narrowly appropriate? They don't know what is, what is the development of the case hasn't come on. And so, um, uh, so in, internally, the rules themselves I have problems with, and then the rules also sort of take a, the prog rules also sort of take a left turn and start talking about arbitrators serving as mediators and settlement and so just, a lot of things about the rules internally that I disagree with and I have problems with it. They don't seem to me to be either internally consistent or, or, uh, or at least helpful. And, and at the same time, not really um, uh, oriented towards uh, achieving the goals that they advertise. Um, finally, the last thing I'd say is, you know, you, Gabrielle, Lucas, we could all sit down together, the three of us, and we could write up some great ideas about international arbitration, I'm sure. Um, um, but the problem with that is, is would we consider those, uh, those, those wonderful ideas that we have uh, to be soft law instruments that are guidelines uh, that reflect the universal approach to international arbitration? Um, well, we three might, but the question is, should anybody else? And, and I would suggest that despite the brilliance that I'm sure that would be put into that document that we created, um, they're not going to be authoritative. It's not an authoritative thing. Uh, and the IBA rules have developed in several iterations through an organization that's broadly based, um, reflecting common practices already underway and already subject to revision even now, I, as I understand. And, and um, they reflect practice. And that's what gives value to uh, a set of guidelines. And so uh, I, for those reasons, now all of this caveated, if we're sitting here 10 years from now and you, we do this again and you say, and we're talking about how the prog rules have been used throughout the world and everyone is relying on, on them and they are great, and wonderful and change the practice of arbitration. Obviously I have to revise my point of view, but um, as we're standing here today, um, I just don't think that they're a necessary thing. I will say this, if you want to treat them as, a set of suggestions for how people in a certain sector or a certain region of the world, primarily, I think they were inspired from Eastern Europe and CIS countries experience. Um, sure. You look at them as suggestions and proposals and ideas for how you can do things, but to put them on the sort of as a, as a counterweight to the IBA rules of evidence, I don't think that that's probably an appropriate analysis. Excellent. Thank you very much. Let me just reinforce, as Lucas mentioned before, that we are receiving the questions that are addressed in our YouTube page. Thank you very much for everyone that has been addressing. We are going to try to bring them to the discussion here. Let me, if, if I might, let me just make uh, a special reference to 
Professor Andrea Jobim de Azevedo that have been posing some concerns and questions, especially related to the um, to the, the the data protection and all the document protection uh, things that we are uh, discussion here. Professor Andrea Jobim de Azevedo is our former president at CAFI, so it's a, it's a great honor to have him and all the colleagues here. But uh, now, especially concerning um, uh, what you mentioned regarding the, the, the characteristic of soft law and, and not uh, enforceability necessarily of either the IBA guidelines, the trade rules, or any guidelines that we might use. If we, uh, uh, of course, we, we might and, and we should consider them like that. But uh, on the other hand, uh, arbitration is a very much um, flexible procedure. But um, with the, um, the, 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 the basis of the consent of the parties and the agreement that they make between them. So my point here is, in the either in the arbitration clause or as to reference of arbitration chambers rules or even to any of those guidelines we might have the uh, the, the uh, necessity to fill, for, fulfill some particular rules that the parties have chosen between them to be the ones to conduct the arbitration right so if they explicitly and if they have the consent and if they make reference to, for example, rules of a particular arbitration chamber, like the Chamber of the Bitter Soup, for example, uh, we, uh, I guess we have to consider them bound to those specific rules. So my question here is, uh, do you see in your practice and as having been practicing in uh, most of the main chambers that we have around the world, do you see differences um, of rules that have been specifically uh, applied in the, the, the chamber's rules and in the, the, the choice of the parties as to refer to those rules? Well, there are, I mean, there are, there are yes and no. Uh, most chambers in the rules will affirm the right of the arbitrator to uh, order the parties to produce evidence generally um or facts or produce uh, produce uh evidence uh, of any kind and that you see those kind of broad statements such as in the icc rules 25 6 or or the instructional uh, article rules 27 3 um where there's just kind of a broad remit given to the arbitrators to order and then the con uh, order evidence to be produced or turned over or to be um, um given to the tribunal in one form or another um and 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 and, and so those rules there you know can provide a common platform where it is it is well accepted now in international arbitration the arbitrators have this right they have this authority and typically this authority is exercised in response to the application by one side or another uh, that a document be produced to them so those commonalities tend to exist uh, then you start to see other changes uh, in the rules that can be a little bit different and you have the ICDR rules as an example uh, in uh, Article 21, and where there there's some very specific statements made about what kind of evidentiary um, um, documents should be produced. And in, in actual fact, those statements in the ICDR rules reflect very much the standards found in the IBA rules. So the ICDR rules, I think, make sure I say this correctly, the International Center for Dispute Resolution, the AAAs, the American Arbitration Association's international arm, um, their rules reflect what you find in the IBA rules as on, on evidence. So in that sense, we see a commonality between the IBA rules, which are more just guidelines used by parties incorporated and used in the proceedings next to the arbitration rules. Um, you see them being incorporated into what we, maybe we could consider to be the hard rules, the rules that have been selected by the parties uh, in, in the, to govern their proceeding. And so you see that in, as an example, with the International Center for Dispute Resolution. Uh, also there in the ICDR rules, you also see in Article 22, um, some guidance on privilege issues, attorney-client privilege and other kinds. Um, and, and that, those standards there, again, very much reflect what is found within the IBA rules. So you see some, some sets of rules that go above and beyond 
sort of essentially just authorizing the arbitrators to, to order evidence to be turned over. Um, with regard to, do you want me to, do we want to talk about data protection now or do, should we wait to, until a specific question on that? No, feel free. Uh, I mean, I was just uh, uh, bringing up the, the, the questions and the concerns. And I, I guess overall, our main topic here is the boundaries to whether we, we can, the parties can establish, uh, the arbitration chambers can establish that within the, your uh, particular rules. And if we have those boundaries, uh, that could be considered either in uh, privileges, attorney client, or data protection, and et cetera. So feel free to make your remarks. Thank you very much. No, no, sure. I, um, well, let me just say that the, the, the institution that is going to probably, or the, the, the body that is going to be most interested in, in implementing um, data protection uh, protocols uh, is the arbitral institutions. And you see that the AAA, as an example, again, the ICDR uh, has, you know, developed a very extensive set of uh, data protocols that the, the, the arbitrators and the parties are asked to follow um, in order to pro protect evidence. Those protocols, specific or otherwise, build upon a long tradition that's reflected within the IBA rules, Article 9, which allows for arbitrators to, to fashion rules on confidentiality to allow for um, confidential uh, documents to be <clears throat> used, but then only for the purpose in the arbitration. Uh, and uh, next to that, uh, some, some practitioners such as Michael Lang, QC of, of or SE of, the, uh, of, of Singapore, has developed even more extensive, which I use as an appendix in my book, uh, even more extensive um, guidelines for how documentation that's been produced in a confidential way in, in, in consideration of things like data protection requirements and this kind of thing um, uh, can be implemented. So arbitration's flexibility allows for uh, uh, ad hoc solutions to be developed by tribunals to allow for the necess necessary sensitivity to be observed. But at the same time, uh, institutions themselves are giving out guidelines on this and, um, and are allowing, uh, developing these guidelines for the purposes of allowing parties to participate in the process with sensitive data and information while at the same time observing any obligations or regulations that obtain to it. Oh, thank you. Um, well, getting back to arbitration rules from uh, institutions around the world, uh, is there a practice not, not just regarding uh, data protection, but uh, uh, to document protection in general that you believe uh, should be uh, adopted if it is not already adopted uh, in, the, in those rules? Uh, and also I'd like to, to hear about it about you, if you do believe that there are some convenient provisions that should be inserted when a practitioner is drafting an arbitration clause regarding document production. My general feeling, feeling about evidentiary proceeding uh, procedures in uh, arbitration rules is that um, that I would prefer that our arbitration institutions to the most part leave those issues to the arbitrators to decide and follow, uh, especially in reference to the IBA rules. Um, I think that the development of the IBA rules is particularly positive is because it can be used in every arbitration just about, um, no matter what the institution is that's involved. And that helps us to develop a standardization of practice that allows us to anticipate the kind of things that are going to happen. Uh, of course, all of this is persuasive. The parties can always, always make changes. They can always alter what they want to do. And, 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 and the arbitrators and the council can maybe sit together and fashion specific uh, procedural order that they want to follow. Um, however, the, 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 to, if the arbitral institutions each start adopting their own specific rules on the taking of evidence. Um, I'm, a, I, 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 I'm a reticent, I'm a little bit hesitant to uh, support that because 
I, 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 it, it's helpful that if I do an LCIA arbitration or if I do a SIAC arbitration or I do an ICC arbitration, that, there, that I can refer the arbitrators back to a very specific, uh, the same set, the same standards um, and say, look, these are the standards that we're all using. Uh, they're not binding, but nevertheless, they are persuasive and we would like you to look at them and, 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 and help us in fashioning this procedure by adopting an approach that's consistent with, with what we see there. Um, so that would be my general view. On the ICDR rules, they do have very specific rules, but I think that has a little bit to do as much as anything with restraining the American tendencies to want to follow American procedure uh, and allow for wide ranging discovery and depositions and everything else. And, 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 and so they, they've kind of put it into their rules very specifically because they want arbitrators in the United States to, to look to the international standards as opposed to, to following American standards. So that's why I think you see it a little bit more there. So that's, I, I guess that would be my general view on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I see that we have many questions here being posed in our chat regarding the limits and the possibilities of the arbitral tribunal imposing document production, especially when the party, one of the parties do not agree to do so. So um, in your point of view, my question is in your point of view, when and how do you think that the arbitral tribunal could or should impel party to, to, to produce that evidence um, if uh, they are unwilling to do so. And especially what are the, considering that arbitration is about the consent of the parties that are involved in that particular procedure. And I totally agree that the parties and the arbitrators, they can tailor the dispute and the limits and the boundaries. Uh, but, uh, then we have another particular issue that many people have addressed here in our chat, and I maybe can suppose that, um, because just to, to put that in context, we do have an arbitration competition going on now in Brazil, the National Arbitration Competition, and the case has a lot to do with the limits, the boundaries of that document production, especially in the case that the document is not in possession of the parties that are bound to that arbitration procedure. So can we consider arbitrators to be empowered to request or order our, um, the document production that is in, 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 uh, on the hands of uh, people differently from the ones that are involved in that procedure? And would it make a difference, for example, if the party that is in uh, the, the person or the company that is in possession of the document uh, is part of a, the same economic group or somehow can be not uh, necessarily bound to the arbitration clause but connected to the, uh, the, 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 the all the facts and circumstances that are attached. Yeah, so let me address that very specifically, that question. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the rules themselves um, contain a standard, um, uh, which is that when a party seeks document requests, they, under Article 3, um, 3, they need to establish, under the IBA rules, Article 3, 3, um, they need to establish that the document is in the possession, custody, or control of the opposing uh, party. Um, and so the question with economic units where you have subsidiaries and parent companies and, and all operating, um, maybe you, you see this uh, all the time in the context of construction uh, disputes, as an example. Um, the question that the, the, the temptation may be from one side who doesn't like a document request to say, I'm sorry, it's, it's our, technically it's in our, our safe uh, in the corporate headquarters in, in England and uh, we're unable uh, in this arbitration to produce it here. So the traditional point of view of this is to establish, is, is, to, is to consider that standard custody, control, or possession uh, in a fairly broad sense, which is to say the party asking, making the request has to provide some prima facie evidence uh, that they think that there's a reasonable reason, belief uh, that that party has the ability to obtain the document. 
And I think if you were able to show that the document uh, was part of a company that was part of a group of companies, uh, you would it, you would you would be able to demonstrate that. You would be able to say, well, look, there's a reasonable basis for us to ask them to produce it. It's it's held by their sister company, their, their maybe their parent company, whatever. And um, they should be able to call within their group of companies and obtain the access to that evidence. Um, once the party that's made the request has produced some evidence that the part the, the, this document is generally available, um, it's up for the other side then to demonstrate why it would not be. Um, and I can tell you that the evidence, as I cite in my book, that the, 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 the cases that have considered this question, uh, arbitrators have, have been fairly uh, practical in their point of view on this. Um, they, while we all accept the entity theory that companies are different companies, um, they have also said, yes, but you have a, you're, a, you're under common ownership or you're part of the same group and it should be something reasonable uh, that you are able to obtain this document. Uh, and so it's that possession custody or control standard that really becomes the issue uh, when you're looking at that question. And so I would say that the, the burden really shifts to the party that is claiming that this internal uh, group of companies that exist um, somehow they're prohibited from obtaining this evidence. I think it becomes their burden to demonstrate why, despite their strong and close connections as companies to each other, despite the fact that they're part of the same economic relationship and group, despite the fact that they're working together consistently on a regular basis, despite the fact that there are officers and owners that, you know, that are common between them, despite all of this, there's some reason why this document should be considered outside of their potential possession, custody, or control. And uh, if they can show that, um, you know, and, and that there's some basis for that, then sure, arbitrators would be willing to potentially accept that explanation. But if a company says, uh, you know, they are very formalistic and say, we don't want to go call our sister company and ask for the document, the arbitrators are then left with a decision as to whether or not they should draw an inference against that party, which is to say, uh, determine whether or not the evidence uh, that would be, that, that is, it has been the explanation, what that evidence is intended to, to, to prove would in fact prove the point. Um, and, and they can draw a negative inference against a party. They also under the IBA rules have the option of, of if, if they feel that they're just being uncooperative, um, they have the option of, of, of ruling that they are to uh, bear the costs of the arbitration, you know, at, least to, at least in regard to the document production issues. Um, and so that, that, that is also in the IBA rule. So they have those, those tools they can use um, to, to sort of compel uh, compliance by the party that's reticent to comply and, 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 and turn over a document. Okay, um, following on this same question, um, you've mentioned that uh, in those extreme circumstances, the an art tribunal would be forced to draw a negative inference uh, from a reluctant board in producing a document, even though the art tribunal has already issued an order in this sense. But uh, are there cases in which even if the art tribunal uh, uh, orders the production of some evidence, uh, a negative inference would not be an adequate measure to to deal with uh, a party that has not uh, complied with uh, the tribunal's order. Yeah, um, when when the when the inference that's being requested uh, to be drawn is one that's inconsistent with other evidence. Uh, tribunals will often say, yes, they should have turned over the evidence. Yes, we would have liked to have seen it. But what you're asking us to draw as the inference from their failure to do it is inconsistent with other things that we know about in the evidentiary file. And so therefore, you know, it wouldn't be appropriate for us to draw that inference. So typically speaking, you, if you can establish that the party knew that they had an obligation to preserve and produce that document, that the inference that's being drawn or being requested to be drawn is one that's consistent with other evidence, that there is some maybe prima facie evidence already in existence that that inference is appropriate. Um, if you follow, generally look to those guidelines and those things are true, then, then uh, tribunals typically 
feel that they can draw the inference. Um, but if they, if the inference that's being requested is something entirely inconsistent with the evidence or inappropriate for, for a number of reasons, then they don't have to do that. Thank you very much. We are almost approaching our finishing time. Um, of course, this is a subject matter that we could, and, and I wish we could uh, keep going and I wish we can in the future maybe have the opportunity to discuss uh, it even further, maybe in Los Angeles or in Brazil, you're always welcome to come here. But since we are almost approaching our time, um, I would leave it open in this ending for maybe some final remarks or any additional comments if you would like to, to do so. Again, uh, thanking you very much, Nathan, for being here. Thanking everyone that is with us on YouTube and, and everyone that has given support because this is uh, all what it is about having um, all our arbitration community uh, not only in Brazil, but uh, one of the good things about the pandemic is that we can um, discuss it and, and, and be cross borders uh, with a little more efficiency. So um, I'll just leave it open now if you would like to, to make final remarks, maybe future perspectives or any issues that you think that maybe would be, should be in our spotlight for the future. Well, um, well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I'm glad that we had um, at least some questions or issues come up through the course of the call, uh, discussion today that were um, uh, useful to, for me to try to address. Um, just generally speaking, I think that uh, one of the things I believe about, the question always comes to mind, what, what is an international arbitration lawyer? Uh, so who is someone who knows, who can call themselves um, an international arbitration lawyer? And I certainly think that one of the characteristics of someone who is a specialist in this field is to understand um, these evidentiary practices uh, and to understand how these things work. And over the years, uh, these were practices that sort of everybody knew, but nobody ever wrote about because it just kind of happened. And so in the last decade or so, we have seen a lot of writing on different aspects of procedure that are very helpful for initiating new in, uh, entrants into the field. And so I think that both the fact that you have a, a MOOC competition that addresses this issue, um, the fact that you're doing webinars like these and, 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 and bringing in uh, people to understand how these uh, standards work and, and, uh, and how what, you know we we could do a whole webinar and what it means that what does it mean to produce a document that is relevant to the case and material to its outcome, um, it, you know, what are these different standards in Article Three and otherwise what, this objections Article Nine? What do they mean? Um, those are really useful things because they are the nuts and bolts of practice, and 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 they uh, inform strategic decisions. I had a great discussion like this in Perth, Australia, just a few months ago where. We sat down with a group of practitioners there and discussed what the things that they are seeing happen. And we're talking about the common and same standards. And so that's it's a really it's a really positive thing to 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 know that organizations like your own are promoting and developing this this and and also that that uh, there's interest in these things because I think this helps promote the practice of international arbitration. The way forward. Uh, very difficult to say what's going to happen. I mean, the pandemic has shown us that predictions are, are useless <laughs> because we have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow and, and, and no idea what will happen next week. But if everything were to say, come back to a normal posture and we were able to see um, the way forward in terms of uh, continuing the development of the world economy, um, then arbitration will continue to thrive, I think. Um, and I can, I think it will continue to present uh, the way and the solution for the thorny issue of having to resolve uh, disputes that are um, cross-border in nature. So I applaud you. Uh, I'm really happy to know that there's interest in this issue and um, always willing to discuss it with, with individuals or practitioners. Um, I work with arbitrators from all over the world all the time, both as arbitrator and counsel. And, and I say, it's always great to meet people from different parts of the world so that we can discuss some of these things and have a common understanding. So it's wonderful that, that you're doing this and, and thank you for having me. 
Well, thank you so much, Nathan. Um, well, we've received a lot of questions from our audience. We try to, to refer them as many as we could in this time. Uh, there's only one final question that I believe it is important to, for you to address, uh, which would be where or how a Brazilian students could access your book that uh, we've referred more than once. And please. So most law libraries have it. Um, so if you, you know, obviously, uh, and, and, and uh, a lot of law firms have it. Um, so uh, I've had students come to law firms and, and ask to borrow their version of it. Um, obviously, you can buy it, but if you're a student, maybe you don't want to spend that much money on a, on a, on a, on a book. Uh, you've got a lot of other things to worry about than buying books uh, about uh, evidence and international arbitration. Um, so, I mean, the, 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 most, of the, most of the things that... Uh, I can tell you are the public, the, the, the law libraries uh, tend to follow, uh, have it. Uh, law firms tend to have it. It's available online, obviously, if you want to uh, uh, purchase it there. And um, and that's the uh, probably the best uh, advice I can give on that. And and, uh, and and to all you students that are involved in moots and because every year the Viz moot, uh, if it uh, the one in Vienna as an example, um, if it has an evidentiary question, I inevitably know it because I start to get uh, requests and questions that get sent to me. Um, um, th those, those, those moots are doing a great job by trying to get kids to learn and students to learn those things and young, young practitioners to get involved in those things. Um, so, um, you know, I, I've always, I'm always trying to uh, um, re be responsive to those issues when they come up as well. So. Thank you very much for your generosity, not only in the references, but also uh, for being with us today and exchanging so much. Um, hopefully we can meet again soon. Thank you for everyone that have been with us today. Thank you, Lucas, also. And well, I hope to see you again soon. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you, pleasure, bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.